and uh, I'm happy to announce uh, our panelists. We have Rosalind Lavery from WooCommerce. <laughs> we have uh, Miriam Schwab from Elementor and James Giraud from Team WP. <clears throat> this is a, uh, a really cool space. We've got some like, volume to it. This is going to be fantastic. So we're here today to talk about partnerships. I want to give a little bit of context for this. WordPress, as we know, is this, it's a big decentralized ecosystem. There's a lot of players. Coming to a WordCamp like this is a great way to get a sense of just like how big our ecosystem is. And this is still just a small part of it. And one of the best ways that we find to grow in this ecosystem is through partnerships. And in putting this together, uh, I wanted to give you guys a chance to hear from people who have a lot of experience in partnerships. And we have a couple of things we want to accomplish. We want to give you a better sense of what's possible, like open you to new ideas about partnerships, give you a chance to hear from each of them with some guidance on what to look for in a good partnership, what are some of the opportunities and challenges, and then ultimately what we're hoping to do is give you some takeaways that inspire you to go out and work on partnerships of your own. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and get started. So Rosalind, you... Uh, Let's just get a little bit of context for your background. You've, you're not a stranger to WordPress. You've been in this space for a long time. Can you just give folks a little bit of context of where you started and what you do now? Sure, cool. Uh, hi, everyone. I, so I started, I had to go check this. Uh, I started uh, working with WordPress in 2009 and spent a number of years, build, well, a few years building WordPress sites and then a, a number of years building WooCommerce sites. It was quite exciting and uh, I was in South Africa at the time and uh, it was very exciting at the time because there were a lot of people asking for oh, well, how do we make this give us money kind of thing you know um, so that was quite fun uh, and then I worked at uh, some payment companies in BD and partnership mm -hmm. roles uh, for a few years and now I am part of the payment partnership team at WooCommerce and looking at our payment partnerships as well as starting to consider our payment program uh, more broadly within the company. One thing I'm curious about is have you noticed anything? So there's the way that we do partnerships in WordPress and I think WooCommerce is a great example. It's a much more mature in general program compared to like what a lot of folks are doing. But you also have experience in the world like outside and like the, the payment space, et cetera. When you, like, how would you, dis how, how well developed do you feel like the partnership stuff is in the WordPress space today? In WordPress in general, I think to me it, it's almost intrinsically part of it because yep. we're an ecosystem. Yes. Every, like nothing works individually, nothing works on its own. It all is about how we work together. And I think the whole nature of WordPress in itself is a bit of a partnership. Yes. You know, so I, I, I think the whole ecosystem is kind of designed perfectly for partnerships. Um, whether we are that developed in figuring out how we formalize that a yep. little bit more, I think is potentially where there's growth still to be seen, but I think it is part of our ethos. It's, it's like we're, we're well set up for it. And the growth part is what a lot of what I've been noticing is where it makes sense to people. Maybe they just haven't been curious enough or they're, it's intimidating. It's like, where do I start? But there's a general readiness in the space for it. Miriam, so you are also no stranger to WordPress. You've seen and experienced a lot. For those who don't know, can you give us a little bit of your background and what you're doing now? Sure. Um, so I started working with WordPress about 15, 16 years ago when I founded a WordPress development agency uh, based in Israel. We worked with leading Israeli tech companies and large organizations building custom implementations for them on WordPress. Um, through the years, I came to be familiar with all of the benefits and some of the disadvantages of working with WordPress, particularly around performance, scaling, and security, and tried to look for solutions for that, and in the end came to the conclusion um, that publishing site, WordPress sites in a static format would solve all of that, and I founded a company called Stratic. Um, worked on that for quite a few years, um, and it was acquired a year ago by Elementor. So now I'm at Elementor, and uh, I have a relatively new position there as head of WordPress relations. So in my agency and at Stratic and now at Elementor, I've had different types of experience um, and interactions around partnerships. And one of the things I love, too, is you've also seen a gamut, having both been at the, on the hosting side of things, and Elementor is a massive plugin in the space with its own, really, ecosystem around it as well. So you get this, you've had a, a very rich, sort of diverse range of experiences on that front. 
Yeah, um, depending on where you are at within our ecosystem, within WordPress, uh, partnerships might look a little differently to yes. you, whether you know, you're, there's many agencies here who are working on par partnerships as well, uh, or if you're a product company or hosting company, um, or a company like Elementor where it's a, there's a plugin and there's hosting yep. and, and there's Stratic now. Um, and like you said, Elementor is very interesting because it has a very large ecosystem around it. Wow, I can't remember the number of plugins. I think there might be like something like a thousand extensions. No, just focused on that. Yeah, yeah, built just for Elementor, which is crazy. And some of those uh, extensions and, and plugins are generating serious revenue. So it's like a mini ecosystem in and of itself. And, and I think it's worth saying too, and while uh, just to plant the seed broadly, that partnerships is a very encompassing term that can mean a lot of different things, right? Like that's part of what you're alluding to there is like the way that Elementor would do it might be different than what a hosting company would do versus a small agency. Like partnerships is relevant and just the seed I wanna plant with you broadly is don't just assume what it means. Like for some people, a partnership is, oh, we're gonna have an affiliate arrangement and generally versus all the way to like a very deep integration. And one of the examples is, is paperwork being signed or not? That's one of the, like one of the, uh, turning points where at least in general I find it's okay now it's more serious. Right. I think um, what you were saying about WordPress like the nature of our ecosystem being one that kind of uh, just develops partnerships in and of itself. So I think Elementor is a good example of that because Elementor was developed to be extensible. Yes. Right. And uh, actually That's I was just talking cool. to yeah. someone who used to extend plugins and was working with Elementor and he was so thrilled with Elementor's documentation as a developer. So from the beginning if you're building a product and you build it so that others can build on top of it and around it. Yes then you're already creating a form of partnerships by actually just almost not doing anything. Yep, <laughs> so you're I facilitating think that. Yeah. So James, you, you've had uh, quite the background in WordPress as well, and you've had a, like, an especially special way of seeing like, the partnership side of the ecosystem grow. Please tell us a little bit about where, when WordPress came into the radar for you, what that looked like, and then what you're doing today. Yeah, uh, I have been in the WordPress space almost as long as Miriam, actually, about 14, 15 years. Uh, started out running my own little agency. I uh, did some product work for uh, PageLines theme back in the day, yeah. for those yeah. of you who may remember, one of the first page builders, building themes and plugins there, and then got hired on, actually, as their director of operations and doing community management uh, before making the leap to Envato, where I was for a while. Um, uh, as the author engagement lead. That was kind of my, yep. my main role, working with all 60,000 of the independent uh, creators in the Envato ecosystem, including many WordPress developers. Now, we talked about this, so this is it's interesting too because of the timing, like partnerships as a concept mm. hadn't really been formalized. Right. So it was author engagement. Yeah, author it's engagement. So, I mean, if you think about, it's sort of like a mashup of partnerships and community yes. engagement and yes, community yes, yes, management yes. because so much of what we do uh, working with at scale with so many independent creators is community, right? Just like in WordPress. Um, and so you're navigating a lot of the, the challenges and opportunities that come along with that. Um, I also worked at Gravity Forms, which is a plugin many people may know in the space, and most recently was at Stellar WP. And what are you doing now? Give us some context. Oh, what that. am I doing now? Now I, uh, in the last 18, 20 weeks, have uh, been going uh, full steam into Team WP, which is a team and culture platform for WordPress companies. James, one of the things I loved about the work you did with Envato early on is like you're very much getting into, and this is general about partnerships, is it's work that really affects people's livelihoods. Mm -hmm. When it goes well, it makes it's, it's fantastic. When it doesn't, like a, a strong partnership can be, can make all the difference in a business. And it's all, one of the things that we can sometimes just say, oh, it's business, but partnerships is also very much about the relationships and like how well people fit together. There's a cultural aspect to it as well. So. You guys, we have a lot of perspective that we can draw from here. What I want to start with is talk a bit about uh, partnerships as a concept. And the first question, I'll start with you, Roslyn, is when you think about partnerships, for those who, like, so first I agree that like, it's a general way that we kind of do things in WordPress. But now when I, when for, for purposes of this discussion, I'm talking about like more formal, especially on the like commercial and the business side of things. Like we're growing together in a partnership, so that's the context for it. From your perspective, like, what are some of the benefits and trade-offs that that folks should be aware of when they're thinking about partnerships? I think that's it's always so broad, uh, yes. and this is this is kind of because it depends how you've designed your partnerships yes. or kind of what you're wanting to get out of it. I I always see partnerships as being a balance. It 
to me, I sort of like I don't really put affiliates into a partnership concept in yep. my mind because to me that's often a lot more one way. Yeah, like, can you just touch on that for a moment? Because I think that's an important concept. <laughs> like people, a lot, a lot of times I've heard multiple people, oh, I have affiliates. And it's like, what's that, the one way yeah, versus two way? And the way that I see it is that the, the definition of partnership means that there has to be benefit going both directions yes. and kind of similar benefit going back and forth between both sides. So affiliate is a lot more, a lot of the time is kind of based, I see it as being a little bit more of a, a one-way benefit in yep. a way that is then compensated. Yes. And that's a bit of a transaction that is, there's something going one way and we're paying for it in the other direction, but it's almost more like a sale. Yes. And less like I am trading with you and I am, I'm giving something and it's coming back, but together we're growing more than what we would if we were individually selling those things to different people or something. It's a bit harder to, but there's, it's a bit of the, you know, one plus one is more than yep. two kind of so concept. In, so one of the clear benefits, <laughs> yeah. if, you're, if it's two ways, that you're growing together, your interests are aligned. What's, one of, what's a trade-off? Like what's a downside of that level of, like you're, you're both working closely together? I think the tricky thing that you have to be aware of when you are building partnerships is how you manage the competition behind that. Because okay. naturally what ends up happening as you start building partnerships is it becomes a, a question of, well, what you're doing is you're making something more together than you would individually, yes. but now it means that you're growing differently to how you are to the rest of the ecosystem. And particularly, I think when you're in a space of an ecosystem, you're now starting to elevate particular people or particular partnerships yeah. within you're that making space. Choices, yeah. And how do you make sure that you're still growing the broader ecosystem as part of that? And how do you balance that competition that happens between the different partners that yep. you have um, and keep that balance in a way that you don't end up? Because in my mind as well, like you can get exclusive partnerships. They're not the ones that I tend to prefer because yep. I think they often remove people out of the ecosystem more than they actually encourage them. This is a key point. This is something that uh, for folks who are new to it, I've noticed this a lot, where they'll gravitate towards exclusive. Yeah. And, and it, it makes sense at, at first blush, like why someone would ask for that. And, but in general, it, it's like, uh, at least in my experience, it is a, more of a short term. Like it's maybe a short term win, but you're missing out in the long run. Yes, and I, I, I sort of, I associate that to the concept of growing the pie. Like yes. you want to together be growing the pie as well as each other's business. Yes. And the growing the pie piece is very difficult to do in an exclusive arrangement um, because I like that. invariably, you know, the, the world changes systems, what you need out of it, you almost become a bit too comfortable in an exclusive yeah. environment yep. because there isn't in you know, it's a little bit like the, what you would expect. You're going to get the worst coffee at an airport because <laughs> you yeah. know, like what, you've got no, you've you got have. no, yeah. exactly. And I think I, I, I sort of, I, I, I put exclusivity into a bit of a similar thing. So I think there are times when it can work, but I think it's a tricky piece of it. And, and a lot of the time for me, it's more about how you find that balance and how you, how you build partnerships in a way that shows and creates value yeah. that is beneficial to both sides of that partnership, as well as the users or merchants or whoever that you're actually yep. doing that partnership for. There's always a third party, and I think taking that third party into account, you're generally partnering to build value between two companies, but for the benefit of, of a broader yes. community. So there's always that third element that you have to take into account. That's a key point because sometimes people talk about partnerships, but if you lose focus on the, the mutual customer, yeah. then it's like, oh, we have a partnership, but it doesn't really go anywhere. Miriam, so from your perspective, it's a similar question, like you have a lot of experience in partnerships. You've seen it from multiple lenses now on the hosting side, then the plugin side of things. Um, and what are some of the, the benefits and, and trade-offs especially that stand out to you? Um, well, like you mentioned, the benefit really is one plus one equals more yeah, than two. It's, it's an exponential. Um, yeah. yeah. And I, I think that's one of the wonderful things about being in business in general and in WordPress specifically, which is that uh, instead of everyone just doing their own thing and staying in their own lane, if we each bring our value to each other's customers, then everyone wins, and including the customer, right? Because... Like, for example, with Elementor, Elementor's uh, market share is, is relatively large. Yeah. Um, and so what happens is a lot of other products in the ecosystem will see that a, a large percentage of their users are using Elementor. 
So how can we make sure that these users are getting the best possible experience? We can all pretend that like you're doing your thing and we're doing our thing and there's no overlap, or we can look at it and say, okay, our mutual users are gaining value from you, value from us. Now how can we collaborate, at least, or at the very least communicate around that um, reality and make sure that we're bringing the best possible experience. Yes, I like that. James, you've, you've had this, um, like one of the reasons why you focus on the culture side of things now is that you've, you've been a part of that at multiple steps in the different organizations that you've been in, both being acquired. Like there's, a, there's all these cultural things that often don't get talked about so much that have an impact. I'm curious, from a partnerships perspective, what are some of the benefits that you've noticed like when it comes to the culture of a company, when you're doing, like, so company A has a certain way of doing things. So commercially, they agree that this is a, we're gonna work well together. And like Rosalind was saying, it's gonna be a two way, we're really gonna work, but maybe they're very different cultures. I think um, one of the interesting things about the space is anybody can start, Yeah. right? Yes. Anybody can create a company, anyone can create a product. And because of that, you get, the opportunity to, to see different perspectives on ways of working and like how you approach problem solving, how you approach the, yep. um, the user story or the customer experience, right? And so the, one of the great opportunities of partnerships is the opportunity to be exposed to different ways of working. And so a great example actually I can tell is a story of Envato and Elementor. So very early on, um, I say early on, it was a few years ago now, maybe not <laughs> so early, but like Elementor um, had been working toward this thing called template kits, right? This idea of a library of templates that you can do. And obviously Envato has this huge community of uh, authors that are designers and creating demos and doing all of that, that kind of thing. And one of the things that was really neat for me being in that story was watching the way that um, the Elementor crew would craft an agenda mm. for our meetings together ah. and being really clear about the outcomes of the meetings and disciplined around what we were going to talk about and watching that culture come through. I don't know if that's an Israeli thing or if it was just uh, the, the actually, discipline. There's a Hebrew word for that. It's tachlis. Okay. Tachlis means let's get to the point. If it's, yeah. I heard someone laugh. <laughs> so they've heard the word. So, so for me, you know, I, I was in an Australian company and it's a little bit more casual, right? And things, we feel each other out a lot yeah. more. And so there's that sort of like cultural dynamic as well. It was really interesting getting into these conversations and, and being able like, being able to go, oh, I like that. Like, I like that way of doing things because we get right to the point we get into it. Um, so yes, yeah, so that was, that's from a cultural point of view, that's kind of fun to, to be exposed. To Are there any trade-offs that stand out? Um, I think... Uh, like as far as partnerships go, the trade-off obviously is that they take longer, Yeah. right? And so if you are going in expecting things to happen, um, in partnerships, you have to remember that the partnership is always secondary to the primary, the primary thing yep. that's happening. So, uh, I want know. to touch on it from a slightly different perspective. Sure. Let's, so with WordPress, one of the, at least for me, one of the big benefits is that you have all this, like people from very different backgrounds and perspectives and contexts, mm coming together, WordCamps to me are a beautiful example of that. Mm. So in partnerships, I think it's quite natural because of our ecosystem for people to say, oh, we should do business together. And right. that's a logical conclusion. Yet they're coming from a very like different context or like, different set of like different culture, different. So from my perspective, I see the benefits mm. of that, right? Because we serve a global audience. I think the more intermixed you can be, the better. But what are, are there any trade-offs that stand out to you from a culture perspective where it's like company A is very much this way and B that way. I think um, being clear on what the value of the partnership is yeah. going to be. I mean, I mean, for a lot of people it's revenue, right? Yep. Like ROI, what is this going to, to lead me to? Um, and partnerships are a long game, Yes. right? And so if you get into it for a short term thing, I think sometimes that can work and sometimes there are short term goals right, that you can assign to it, but um, they really are about the long-term value that you're gonna get out of it. Um, so if, if you have misalignment around what the ROI is going to be, yeah. that's something that you really have to get clarity on right away. I think that's a good transition to the next. So, so Rosalind, from your perspective, uh, what, what are some of the things that you look for? It's almost like, what are some of the, the, the positive indicators of a, a partnership? So you just mentioned like the values alignment or you get one similar things, but from, from your perspective, yeah, what do you look for? I 
think the starting point often is just shared customers yep. because of what I was speaking about. Like ultimately, you're you're really designing a partnership to create benefit for both the companies, but mostly for the the end users who are actually going to yep. benefit from that. I think at the same time, that's not enough. Okay. And just having shared customers doesn't necessarily mean that there's a way to actually create value beyond yep. just having shared customers. Uh, so I think. For me, it's, it's a lot of the time it's understanding shared goals okay. as well between companies. What's an example of a shared goal? Like you've so, got a shared customer, but yeah. I think a lot of the time, a lot of, so I've worked mostly in product partnerships, okay. which is quite a specific yep. um, field within partnerships. And a lot of the time it is about finding shared incentives that mean that you build a better product together, yes. which ultimately benefits the end customer at the end of the day. So. I think that is where things can really sort of spearhead the, we're making more than two from the yes. one plus one. Um, so is there, is there opportunity available to be able to create deeper integration that we wouldn't be able to invest the resources in unless there was a way that we were going to accelerate revenue growth Yep. by doing this. And it is a long-term goal. There is a lot to that. But I, so I think the, the, the kind of, Product integration layers are a key part of that. Um, I think there's also looking for how a partnership would benefit how you communicate the ecosystem to your customers. So okay. a lot of what of what we do at WooCommerce as well is using sort of feedback of products that customers are already using and how do we elevate those and how do we position those in a way that customers are finding them better. There's, so there's, I think it's, it's a bit of a layering approach and you have to find that first key thing and yes. then you kind of grow by finding, you know, and I, I think often the, the first things for me are shared customers and then the product and then you start looking at um, the additional layers of how you can grow within the company. Further. One of the things I found useful because, so I agree wholeheartedly, it's shared customers, this sort of shared problem set, this thing that you're doing for them. And then I find that those who do well tend to focus on like some first wins, like, okay, well, how do we get started? And like, cause it's easy to get lost into the details sometimes or overly focused on the commercials, which are important, but like, how do we actually prove that we're creating value together for, for the end customers? Miriam, I'm curious from your perspective, what are some of the things, and so you've had multiple vantage points over the years of what you've looked for, but what, in general, what do you look for in a partnership? Are there anything that you'd add or th things you think of differently? So what you were just mentioning about easy first wins yes. is something that I very much believe in because setting up a full-fledged partnership can sometimes be quite complicated. Like both sides can understand and be aware that there's a lot of opportunity there and yeah. that uh, there's shared customers and uh, just like they can bring more value, et cetera. But sometimes just getting things moving can be complicated and it can even be an, an issue of internal resources, yeah. right? Yeah. Building a partnership takes a lot of time often around different aspects of it, like the planning the strategy and the bureaucracy. So, um, sorry, I roll my eyes at bureaucracy. <laughs> I guess that bureaucracy. What's wrong with bureaucracy? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I want more. Just kidding. <laughs> Less please. <laughs> so, um, so sometimes it's worth it to like start working together. Also, then you get to know each other yeah. and create that initial relationship yep. in a, like a, a simpler way. So, uh, one way is, let's say, to even just set up a shared Slack channel. Let's yeah. start communicating together. Yep. And then we can also share with each other our, our own customers' experiences with each other's products yes. and start to see what it's like to work together. I just want to make that point real quick that for a lot of folks in WordPress, you already have mutual customers. Right. And that's a great place to start is just like, hey, and sometimes that's not obvious. We don't tend to have as much of a focus on like data analytics and sort of understanding. So for some folks who are wanting to work together, that might be exactly where you start getting a Slack room together and say, hey, let's find our mutual customers and yeah. see, can we do more for them? Right, and through those conversations, you can identify even more opportunities yeah. that you might not have thought of if you had just like gone full, like full speed ahead into some like one idea. Yes. And then just another easy aspect of getting started is co-marketing. Yep. I'll talk about your thing, you'll talk about my thing, let's write a few blog posts. It's like pretty simple, it might not be like big wins also, but. It also gets, starts to generate reactions from your yeah, own customers. So it creates momentum. Yeah. yeah. So those are just some easy ways. And I'm a big believer in that um, in terms of just getting momentum going and starting to feel, feel each other out and understand what it's like to work together and build the relationship. So I'm seeing a couple of things. First, in, a, in looking for a partnership. So, okay, you want to do, you want to find companies with, where you can have a mutual win. So you're looking for a couple of things. First, shared customers. I think that's going to, 
I've seen people like, oh, we want to do a partner with so-and-so. Like, well, you don't really have much in common. They're focused on the small business. They're focused on enterprise. You're, you're almost, I've talked to folks who've like said, oh yeah, we tried a partnership and you asked a couple of questions. Like, well, that was very different audiences. So, so finding shared customers, finding this uh, aligned interest in a problem set that you can solve and finding things that you can, like a, a good starting point. It's like, you may have a great long-term idea about how closely you can integrate, but starting with something to just get the ball rolling. James, so from your perspective, like, and especially with kind of what you've seen over the years, how do you measure the success of a partnership? Oh, give me the data question. Great. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, so to start, if you're going for quick wins, that's probably the first place to get your first data set, right? Yeah. So if you don't have any data on a partnership and you're not sure how much investment you want to pour into the partnership, those quick wins, those easy sort of things that don't involve a lot of bureaucracy or overhead or team alignment can be a really good way to sort of prove the value or prove the, the business case for why you want, might want to take the next step for it. Um, I'm a big believer in hypothesis-driven design and development, so start from a hypothesis. We think that uh, by doing this partnership together, we are going to see maybe an X percent uh, you know, number of visits come to that or a number yep. of conversions. Um, and you don't have to set it big, but just see if you can prove your hypothesis yep. and then go from there. Okay, we proved it. What's next? What's next from there? Um, so that's a great way to start getting data and then move beyond that into um, the bigger ROI, which I think is around um, the, the effort scaling, Okay. right? So... You know, uh, from my experience, one of the things that um, often happens is we're already doing our thing. We've already got our campaigns going, our marketing, our activities, our products, and we've got these problems that we're trying to solve for our customers. And when somebody comes alongside us and says, hey, we can solve that problem or, or uh, an ongoing problem faster than you can, right, and still enhance that, that's actually, that helps sell my product anyway. Yes. Right? So it actually increases, as, as Rosalind was saying, that ecosystem view of like, no, just by having other players, other partners in uh, sharing what we're doing together and serving that customer together um, increases the value for both. And then that relationship can get stronger and stronger over time as you start to see those those synergies, I use the word, um, come together. Sorry. It's a, it's a great word. I don't know what the problem is. So, <laughs> Someone had to say it. Roslyn, so from your perspective, so WooCommerce has quite a mature partnership program, lots of experience. Like there's a, there's a strong background doing partnerships. So a lot of folks are going to focus initially on how to get started. We've talked a bit about that. What are some of the things from your experience that stand out in terms of like maintain, like, because a good partnership is going to be long term right? It's going to go for a long time. So what are some of the things that you think about beyond the initial start? Maybe like year after the first year and beyond. What are some of the things that, the way that you think about long term? I think that uh, often has to come down to seeing things from both perspectives. Okay. So uh, a lot of the time how I approach kind of growth conversations or, and, and a lot of the time it's just about let's have a discussion. Let's and, and this is where the relationship side of partnerships comes in, really, is understanding, and kind of what I was speaking about before, understanding what our shared goals are. Yeah. Like, the, it, you know, everything's evolving in the economy all the time. So being able to reevaluate and go, okay, well, have our goals changed? Have our customers changed? Have, you know, like, which, which yep. things have, have changed from the basis of what we started from? And then how do we look at those again? Um, I think, a bit of an analogy, but I, did, I do some handstand training and I kind of see it as, as a little bit of a, like you're constantly tweaking, like you, mm. <laughs> you have to find your foundation. And a lot of the time that foundation is pretty solid and actually remains consistent the whole way through the partnership. So yes. the, the, the basic fundamentals of like where you're generating revenue, what the actual like foundation of that partnership agreement is, is pretty consistent. Yep. And that's around finding your shared customers and making sure that you have um, sh like aligned incentives. Yes. And then beyond that, the way that I approach this and what I was saying is that if you, if you are trying to understand what you would want to do next with a partnership, seeing it from the other person's perspective and going, what would be a win for them? Mm. 
and then looking at it from the other side and going, okay, if that's the win for them and understanding what that is, what are things that I could do on my side that are not a huge cost or things that I'm doing already yep. that would benefit that goal? But you kind of have to put the other person's hat on to go yes. because they don't know what you have to offer. You don't know what they have to offer. But you sort of have to play both sides to be able to figure out how you find growth within that. And I think this is especially relevant in like roadmap discussions where, okay, you, you have a current state. You have something that's working, but you're both going to grow. And I like that you – like this is part of why having that – strong foundation of the line interest matters because if it's loose and like you're focused on one audience and they're focused on another, then odds are you're going to become even more separated. Whereas if you have that same shared interest, yeah, that's so Miriam, what about from your perspective? What, um, what, what, when you think of past that initial stage of a partnership, so you have the quick wins, if you think about long-term success, what are some of the things that are, that you look at as like indicators that this is going to work well for the long term? Well, it really is about making sure that each side feels like they're winning, not just feels. Yes. Sometimes it is about feeling. Sometimes actually. it is. <laughs> like in everything. <laughs> but um, it's actually winning. Yeah. And uh, it is important to keep the other, the other, your partner uh, in mind all the time and make sure that you understand what it is that they want to achieve. And also really to focus on what it is that you want to achieve and be clear yeah. about that. Um, and then keeping an eye on it. Is it working for us? Is it not? Uh, what can we improve or is it really just not meant to be and uh, you know parting ways is hopefully as friends which it should be as friends because it was like an attempt to make each other more successful and if it didn't work it's just it's not necessarily anyone's fault um, I want to yeah. touch on that for a moment because I think uh, a lot of folks at least and maybe it's just because we're still learning how to do this it's like you set something up but people tend to not like ask questions or so like, like have a frank, it's like, oh, we create a partnership, especially if you're public about it. Um, but in your experience, Miriam, like when something's not working, um, why, yeah, like uh, how do you think about that? Like it's. Yeah, so actually in some cases, I said that it's not necessarily anyone's fault. Sometimes what happens is the expectations aren't aligned. Yes. And the expected effort from both sides is not yes. um, just communicated properly. And so, uh, you know, they'll set out on a journey together with expectations that each will do X, but actually that's not what they all each understand. So communication is really important. Um, something else that can be tricky is if one of the players is a much stronger ah, company yeah. than the other. And more I mean experience. stronger, maybe just like, yeah, more experience, larger, more resources. Maybe a marketing team versus not yeah. having one. Yeah. Um, and what can sometimes happen there is not what you would expect. What you would think is that, that because they're larger, they can put more resources towards it. But because they're larger, they'll, they might be working on many, like have their fingers in many yep. pies or whatever. This, I don't feel like that. I don't know what to say. <laughs> fingers in many somethings. <laughs> is it pies? <laughs> Everyone wants to have fingers in pies. Yeah. yeah pies. It's all about pies. Pie. So blueberry. Whatever. Anyways, so... <laughs> um, it, so the, a large organization might not put in the effort yes. that the smaller organization thought that they could or would because they're big. Just because someone's big doesn't mean that that's going, how it's going to be. Yep. Um, and so it's really important that if you're like the smaller player to really, really make sure that like you are uh, demanding in some way uh, what like, you know, that, that both parties are like um, putting in some kind of equal effort. Having said that, sorry, just one more thing. Sometimes working with a larger entity that's putting in less effort still has a ton of value for a smaller company Absolutely. because they've aligned themselves with the brand of the larger company. And so in that way, but at least in that way, the expectations are aligned. Yes. I'm aligning myself with you. Now my brand is part of like seen with your bigger brand and just that on its own practically gives me value. So anyways, communication and expectations. James, uh, so I want to talk a bit more about this, like uh, when things aren't working um, and, and I, I like to focus on the positive, but I think if you, by asking good questions and by anticipating like how you deal with that. So, so in your experience at Envato, you were sometimes in the position of having to like disappoint, communicate disappointments. And sometimes. <laughs> so, so what are, what are some of the ways that, uh, anything besides some perhaps scar tissue, anything that stands out from that experience of like when things aren't working, like how do you, how do you deal with it? How should people think about it? Um, I think the first thing in anything is just remember you're talking to humans. Mm. Uh, you're not talking to machines. And so there are feelings involved no matter. We can say it's just business, but it is just people. 
And um, that, to me, I think, is the number one thing to remember. And, you know, Rosalind said relationships. Miriam has said relationships. It's all relationships. Our community is too small to let failures in these experiences get in the way of good, healthy relationships. So, sorry, I'll get that rant out of the way. But failure, I, 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 would, I wouldn't say failure, or, or I, would, I would say, like, uh, learning opportunities is maybe a better term to, to describe well, that. Let me, let me put it a specific example. Is like, especially as a larger company. Oh, yeah, yeah. You, well, you look at it like a policy change, for instance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You look at like, okay, we need to make an adjustment. Maybe you started out, you have like 10 partnerships, and then you take a step back. WooCommerce is an yeah. element. Like all, as a larger company, you look at this and say, okay, we need to make a change. Yeah. And that change, is, it could have a negative effect yeah. on a smaller partner. Yeah, so we... we Deal with, we dealt with that a lot at Envato, and one of the things you just have to do is, um, first of all, be direct about it. Like, yes. don't don't beat around the bush. Um, you know, one of the challenges we had at Envato is your communications are often scaled. Yeah. So when we would make a policy decision, we weren't impacting one and two; we were impacting tens of thousands. And so, uh, and not just tens of thousands, but um, those are, might be the individual authors, but there's the employees of those author teams, there's their families that, you know, like, and so it's very easy for emotion to get involved in that. So you need to be direct, right? You need to be clear about what the change is, you need to be clear about the why, but you also have to keep your eye on the North Star. What are you working toward? And if ultimately the reason for the policy change is the overall health and yep. growth of the entire ecosystem or the entire experience or the, the, the customer experience, you, you as the, the primary of that partnership, I guess, have to just own that and, and be okay with the flack. And you're going to deal with it, right? Yep. We deal with it in WordPress all the time, right? Our livelihood comes out of this. And when, you know, our, our um, you know, pull request doesn't get accepted for something in a, a new version release that's really going to impact our business, we get emotional, so yeah. it's, it's very similar, yeah. Rosalind, from your perspective, for folks who are starting out, let's take an example of a product company. Um, if they're new to partnerships, and I think, I think uh, for fo especially for folks here, there is probably already this general sense of the value of collaboration and working together on things. But let's say they, they want to say, okay, we want to, to grow. Uh, we want to do something more formal. We want to find our way to align interests. Where would you suggest someone start? Like, how should they think about it? Where should they focus their initial efforts? if they're brand new? It's very hard to get that specific. Uh, I sort of feel like a lot of the time it's just about being curious about the initial conversation okay. and acknowledging that not everything needs to be a yes. Okay. I think part of what I've experienced a little bit with people that are trying to like enter into, the, into a partnership uh, discussion is is a little bit of that of well we have a line cut we have shared customers so they you know it must work like there must be something there and you sort yeah. of you, you I think partnerships when they work are quite obvious actually like they don't require a huge amount of digging ah, yep. you know you, you you shouldn't need to try that hard okay. if you're having to set up new things and set up new structures and try that hard you probably just have not found the right one. Okay. And, and I think you want to start with some things more. I would say you, you probably want to start with companies of a similar size. Yeah, that's a good and point. you want to yep. start in a space where you are already winning. And I think this is also part of what I've seen uh, like go wrong is partnerships are not a good way for you to enter a market. Okay, this is a, an important point because, it, yeah. Yeah, and, it, and it, it is because in order for you to benefit each other, you both need to be bringing a certain value within that same concept at the same time. So you can't be the launch partner for something. That's more of an affiliate kind of yes. style thing where actually what you're looking for is inbound people coming towards you to start a new section. So I think it's something that you're already winning in, that somebody else is already winning in to the similar degree, and then you can start branching out to potentially working with bigger companies or bigger whatever. I think that's a great like, point. So for like products, like a, let's take small products, move some small plugins. What I'm hearing you say is that they might start by saying, okay, let's work with others of similar size, of similar complement, and be able to introduce each other to each other's customers. Like we can sort of work together that way and gain some experience and increase the, increase the degree to which they're winning. Yes, yes, yeah. and, and sort of if, if I'm winning in 
you know, I'm, I'm doing really well. We're both doing really well in the European market. Yeah. And you're tackling um, point of sale and the other person's tackling payments or something. So like, yep. you're working with the same customers, you're working within the same product line, they, but you're both winning within each of those areas and you can support each other to make a better product for the customer. And yeah, and but yeah, I, I, think, I think getting too complicated and yes. trying to dig too deep to find exactly how you're going to find new customers is, is and, too hard to And start. I want to make that, anchor that point too. It's like not, it needs to be a two-way thing so sometimes it's like folks will rightly see partnerships as a great growth opportunity, because it is. You have to make sure that you've done some initial work, that you've done the work that you, that you are winning to an appropriate degree, where you're, saying, you're proving that you have value versus just yeah. seeing someone with an audience already and saying, hey, can I tap into that without yes. having something yes. to bring? You, you, have to bring some, you have to do work yes. as part of that partnership, and I think that's the, that's the point of this. It's a two-way street on both sides. Yeah. You have to bring value, but you also have to actually do work. It can't be a one-way street. Yeah. Miriam, what about you? For someone who's new, um, they, they like this idea of partnerships, they want to get started, where, where, do you, where do you recommend they think? Where should they focus? Um, I guess one way to start is to analyze their own data and just their own interactions with their customers or clients and understand what other products they're using. Yep. Um, uh, so yeah, look at that and Looking then... Looking at support is a great way to do that. Support. Like what, what shows up most often. Yeah, those yeah. types of questions and interactions. Um, and just start to look at that. If it's a product that can bring more value to your, your customer's current setup with you, that's a great win, potentially. Yep. Something that you're not doing. Um, in my experience, when it's something that doesn't overlap at all with what we are doing, whatever we is, yes, and I'm talking yes, about yes. in the previous everything. Um, and then it's also much more comfortable. So in the WordPress space, there is the ability um, and the opportunity to partner with competing co um, companies. Yeah. And it happens all the time. It's just more complicated and it dem <laughs> demands a certain level of expertise to make it work in a way that everyone is comfortable with it. Um, while retaining their own brands and protections and this and that and clients, it's, uh, customers, it's just, it's a whole thing. Um, so if you can start with something that has no overlap yeah. in any way, then I think that also can be an easier way to get started. Cool. James, what about from your perspective? For someone brand new, where should they, where should they start? Uh, start by getting to know people, um, I think is, is good. Build, building relationships and adding value without expecting anything in return. Um, when you're... But James, what if I have to make money? Uh, don't start with money. Don't start with money. If you're fresh, don't, don't do that. Um, it, because that's not what you need, actually. Um, well, let me step back from that. We all need money. I get that. We all want revenue. But yeah. when you're getting started, the most important thing that you can get is audience and credibility. And in WordPress, relationships are the way to grow audience and credibility. So finding those people um, that are complementary to you, that are maybe at the same size as you or, or yeah. in the same kind of like vein as you is good. Learn from them, figure out what the, the problem space is like, um, and then finding ways to, um, to be able to solve uh, the problem together is good. I like what Miriam said about not, not being, you know, like doing the same thing first. Like you might go to their party, but it's probably not a good idea to to do something necessarily uh, with them, that, that might be a little bit rough to start, but you know, like there are complementary things that you can do that, that can support it. So that's where I would start. Excellent. And, and from my perspective, what I would just add, um, like uh, one of the themes that stands out, just the importance of continuing to be curious. One thing in listening to you guys that stands out to me, I like your point about um, like it shouldn't be complicated, like it's yeah. being simple. And I've talked to quite a few folks where there are partnership opportunities that are actually really obvious and they're, they're like looking in harder places. Where, and I, I like the idea of seeing what your customers are already doing because if you're, like your customers can often tell you and then all that you're really doing is starting a relationship. You say, oh, this plugin shows up a lot uh, with my customers. How about we go talk to them? And then at that point, like you were saying, it begins, okay, maybe we can find ways that we can integrate to provide more value in that context. Um, last but not least, from my perspective, I just want to encourage you guys to, to try things, right? Like be curious, 
uh, start with small things, and now, between now and the next WordCamp, then you can tell us about some of the things you've worked on. Thank you each for your time. Appreciate it very much, and uh, Thank you. enjoy the rest of our WordCamp. Thank you. Uh, before you guys race off, I think if anybody has just a quick question, we can squeeze in one or two. There's microphones on both sides. I will stall by saying thank you with these. Oh. Yeah, uh, if anyone wants to jump up to that mic, if not, then... Yeah, if we have time, we can yeah, take a couple questions. Yeah, why not? Just like one or two? Yeah. Sure. We can take one or two questions Are if you there? guys have anything. Yeah, all right. I don't know. I guess not. I think we are at the time, right? Yeah, it's okay, yeah. but it's yes. okay. If you guys have questions afterwards, you can uh, try to catch yeah. these fine folks. Oh, there's one. All right. We'll take one. Uh, who is WooCommerce currently partnered with? They have lots of, you have lots of partners. Uh, if you go look at our marketplace, a lot of those people. <laughs> um, yeah. It, so we, we partner in various categories, payments, marketing, shipping, tax, uh, sort of the, 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 core, the core products that don't, that are not part of core, of the, the core product of WooCommerce, uh, we, I, I guess, acknowledge and realize that we can't solve all the problems and we don't intend to. Yeah. So the core product solves the basics of what you need in order to run a store, but there are a huge around nuances needed, country specific solutions. So a lot of those well, solutions that, are yeah. partners in various different forms. Um, but yeah, the, the, our marketplace and kind of all of the products that are available in there is a yeah. good source to understand kind of like where we, where we look for partners it would be in that. And one of the benefits of being at WordCamp, there's a great WooCommerce booth, so you can go and check it out and ask them. Yeah, so cool. Thank you, guys. Yeah, let's yeah. give one more Thanks round of applause for our wonderful panel. Thank you.